this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning we're going to be thinking about the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, and well, along with that we'll be thinking what it means to be honorable parents. Before we do so, let's uh, pray together. Oh, Father, as we've been th singing and praying and reading from your word this morning, uh, I pray that today you would help things we've said and sung to be internalized in our hearts and our minds as we think together now in your presence. I pray that you would give us your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, I happened to read a website entitled The Secure Teen. And on that website, I read an article entitled Juvenile Delinquency, What Makes Teens Commit Crimes? And I quote a few lines. A teen adopts morals and ethical values from his parents and other family members. It goes without saying that family plays a vital role in shaping a teen's behavior and grooming his or her personality. However, teens become violent or show signs of juvenile delinquency only when they're facing disturbance at home. Broken or disturbed families with bad relations cause teens to go astray or become violent. Further, often the lack of discourse in the family can lead children to find solace outside their homes. When they're not having any communication with their parents or family members at home, they may lose trust and understanding, which can eventually lower their self-esteem. Once they're losing their individuality, they tend to do things they should not do. For example, they shoplift or do drugs. Teens who have not been given any social or moral training, the, the continues, often lead to juvenile delinquency. Now, this was a somewhat popular website I happened to come upon this week, but it's, what it says is broadly supported by what we find in some of the serious social scientists of our era. One of my favorite social scientists is the well-known David G. Myers. He wrote numerous books about society, and he observes, quote, that father absence predicts crime. And he had what he called a 70% rule, that 70% of any runaways, adolescent murderers, long-term prisoners, and many other people who fall, have serious problems, 70% come from a fatherless home. Daniel Moonahan, another important social scientist of the last generation, uses the analogy of an invasion of barbarians, striking term. By this he meant teenage boys who become in enemies of civilization unless they're tamed by what he calls father care. Children, and especially boys, tend to become enemies, barbarians, of, unless they're tamed by a father who is present in their home. Usually that doesn't happen if there's divorce or the parents never end. It's, I find it striking that the Old Testament ends addressing specifically this problem. The last verse in the Old Testament, perhaps the last, and perhaps the last verse written in the Old Testament because it's probably the last book written, uh, is from the book of Malachi that we read just a few moments ago. Let me, this was written some 430 years before the birth of Jesus. So let me read those again. Malachi wrote, predicting the coming of Jesus and what the coming of Jesus would accomplish, said, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents, or else they will come and strike the land with total destruction. Notice the two-sided repentance that Malachi had in view. Parents to children and children to parents. Now, one of the opening events in the New Testament picks up on those verses at the end of the Old Testament. Perhaps you recall that an angel came to visit Zechariah the priest and tell him that his wife, Elizabeth, was going to have a baby. It turned out to be John the Baptist. They did not expect to have children. They were beyond the childbearing age. And when the angel talked to Zechariah, he referred back to these last verses of the Old Testament in explaining his, the special job that John the Baptist, their coming son, would have. He said, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to their Lord, their God, he will go on before the Lord, referring to Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, 
to make ready a people for the Lord. So when John the Baptist came preaching before Jesus came, he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, part of the repentance he specifically had in view was repentance in the relationships between parents and children. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Part of that repentance was repenting about problems in the parent-child relationship. Restoring the relationship between children and parents has been an organic part of the repentance and salvation throughout the whole Bible. So the final promise of the Old Testament, as well as one of the first events in the New Testament, refers to restoration in the parent-child relationship. Now the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. It's obviously addressing a fragile dimension of the way God made us. These relationships are easily damaged. Uh, if we get things right in this area, then it promises that things will generally go well in whatever land the Lord has placed us in. But if we get it wrong, our children could become barbarians. Now, once in a while, this verse has been applied by Christians in a rather thoughtless way as only applying to children. But like all the Ten Commandments, this one expects us to think. Say, what, what's being assumed here? What are we supposed to do? What's... What goes with this? What corresponds with children honoring their parents? And that is, is that parents become honorable parents that are worthy of honor. So this commandment requires that children honor their parents, but it also acts that parents act like honorable parents. And if this is not happening, then repentance is needed. Now, for many years, I was a philosophy professor in secular universities. And one of the classes I taught in many universities were applied ethics classes. So classes like medical ethics for nursing students and business ethics for business students and this kind of thing. And in those classes, we often had the students look at the various codes of ethics that people have for business, for healthcare, and we would study them. Uh, but I also often thought, when I had students studying these codes of ethics for various professions, that there was something dreadfully lacking in those codes. And what's lacking in those many professional codes, though they have some value, is what we find present in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments tell us a, a little bit of the code of ethics toward the end, but a lot of it is about what makes people ready to embrace the code of ethics. Uh, things such as our spiritual and social formation. When we look at the Ten Commandments, it's filled with the context that gives significance and prepares people to, for being responsible in society. It starts, as you know, with the first three commandments dealing with our relationship with God and getting to know God as the one who is both punishes sins but is also a God of great mercy. And then it tells us in the Sabbath commandment that the the, the meaning of our lives, that our lives find meaning as we go back and forth between worshiping God in community and serving God in society. Then we come to the fifth commandment about parent-child relationships. And it's in this relationship that we have our social formation that makes us into the kind of people who are prepared to, to be good, responsible citizens in societies. So there is a moral order in the Ten Commandments so to repeat, the Ten Commandments talk about knowing God, worshiping God community, in community, becoming the kind of people we should be in our family relationships, and then living that out in the other commandments. So for us, whether we are children or parents, or many of us are both children and parents, we have to learn about what it means to honor parents or to be honorable parents. And to do this uh, it has the good of society in view. Now, if we look at the history of interpreting the fifth commandment, there's something striking that I would not have otherwise thought of if I'd not read some of this. This is that this commandment uh, is, has usually been seen by our Christian ancestors as applying not only to the family, but to also, also to other structured relationships that we have in society. So many of our Christian ancestors, when they talked about the fifth commandment, said, well, this obviously applies to school teachers, pastors in the churches, police officers, maybe your boss at work, and so on. Uh, they weren't always quite sure which ones, but yet saw that somehow this commandment applies to many other relationships as well. And for the very good reason that the family was seen as the training ground for all relationships. 
So it's thought that the child who learns how to relate well to his parents or her parents would also relate well to the school teacher or the police officer or the business manager. But also vice versa, that the parent who learned how to be an honorable parent and treat his or her children right would also be prepared for other roles in society by means of that parenting prepares you for other jobs. In fact, we see some of that in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy 3, when the Apostle Paul describes how you can recognize the right people to become the elders and deacons in your churches, he talks about uh, having, finding men who relate well to their children, who are managing their relationship with their children well. So there's some of that even in the Bible. So let's think first. What does it mean that parents must become honorable parents? Now, three things we should consider here. Excuse me. First is that parental authority is always for the benefit of the children. We, we read from Ephesians 6, verse 4 this morning, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, there are many things we'll, we can learn from that, and we should probably think about that a bit more. But one of them is that uh, parents, fathers, have the relationship with their children for the benefit of the child. It's not primarily for the benefit of the parents. This is, I believe, true in all of our relationships where we have been given some responsibility, some, uh, some trust. It's, for example, government authority is for the good of the citizens. It's not for the good of the government officials. Medical authority is good for the patient. It's not primarily intended for the good of the medical doctor. But think about that just for a moment. What that means parenting is not primarily about your satisfaction or your fulfillment. Sure, you get some of that. You get a lot of that from being a parent. I have three children and four grandchildren. Yes, it's one of the most satisfying areas in my life. But at the same time, it becomes so only if you are thinking of the children, not thinking of yourself. If parents are thinking mostly about what they get out of the relationship, uh, the relationship is likely not going to work very well. The second premise, consideration we should make here is that parents, uh, like all people in authority, have been placed by God and are responsible to God for what they do. Now, in a sense, this is part of the responsibility that God gave to humankind in creation. At the beginning of history, God gave Adam and Eve responsibility for the world he had placed them in. They were to care for it, to, to develop it. They were responsible for what happened in the world. Today we experience that responsibility that God has given us in many, many different places. As we live our lives in the family, in business, in church, but in each of the millions of places where God has placed his people, we practice that responsibility for creation that God gave to humankind in creation. And that includes with your children or in the Sunday school, if you're a Sunday school teacher for the church. Uh, we are, have, our responsibility there comes from God, and we really are accountable to God for how we carry out those responsibilities. Now, most uh, Christian churches have some kind of special event when a couple becomes parents or at the birth of each of their children. Some practice dedication, others baptize children. There's a little bit of diversity among Christians, that diversity is worth discussing in the right time and place. But what is common in the middle of that diversity is that parents are publicly committing to become the kinds of parents God wants them to be. P parents are publicly committing to become honorable parents and appealing to God for help and appealing to the church for help. And the church is in turn promising, yes, we will help you with that. Uh, we know you want to become honorable parents before God. We're committing to help you. That's an important event in the life of families and of the church. And it fits with what it means to be honorable parents, that we look to God and to the community of believers for the assistance we need in that. The third consideration is perhaps a little bit intimidating, if these were not intimidating so far. That is, is that parents represent God to their children. Uh, when children learn about God, of course we might hope that they would learn about God from reading the scriptures and seeing what God has done in creation and redemption. 
but in fact, it often doesn't work exactly like that. When children think about God, they think about God as being a lot like one of their parents, or perhaps like their Sunday school teacher. Uh, and these childhood attitudes about God carry on into adulthood. I'm sure I still think about God as being a little like my mother and father, though I'm well past 60 years old. It maybe it's true for you that you still think about God as a little bit like your parents. This is a huge responsibility that we have, that we have to represent God to our children. This, this week, my wife showed me a couple of pages in a book she's reading to prepare for a speech. It's a book called uh, Dis Discipline That Connects With Your Child's Heart by Jim and Lynn Jackson, if you wish to look it up. They make a strong distinction in the way we relate to our children in terms of the kind of response we're looking for. They distinguish between external compliance, when a child just does what he or she is supposed to do, and they distinguish that from help, heartfelt obedience, when a child wants to obey and perhaps even is able to understand why he or she should obey. Children pick that up. Children notice what, your, what motivates you. And when parents are motivated by a selfish desire to control their children, they may become intimidating, they may look authoritarian, and the result is either internal, uh, external compliance or rebellion, but we are then guilty of misrepresenting God to our children. Quite a responsibility. Such, children, such parents, I believe, are doing exactly what Paul told us not to do in Ephesians 6, exasperating their children. Exasperating means driving them crazy. Uh, parents sometimes drive their children crazy, and uh, in so doing, misrepresent God. Um, the Jacksons write, quote, children raised in, an authorit in authoritarian homes often have difficulty comprehending that it is okay to struggle and make mistakes because that is part of life. They find God's love and grace foreign, and many wonder how intimacy with this guilt-inducing God could even be desired, be desirable. To be honorable parents, we have to represent God well to our children. Uh, so part of being a good parent is getting to know what God is like. And of course, in the Ten Commandments that we've read repeatedly during this sermon series, we're told a whole lot about what God is like right in those Ten Commandments reminded that God is the one who saved his people from Egypt. The whole thing makes sense because God had just rescued them. And God is the one who has been providing for them step by step after they came out of Egypt. Now in the second giving of the Ten Commandments, which we read now, this is maybe 40 years after the Exodus, they had a long, long experience of God providing for them. Remember the manna, for a long time they ate food that God specially provided on a daily basis. So there's a lot about what God is like, even in the Ten Commandments here, and we should recall that. And we should think more broadly about how God deals with people throughout the Bible, and that tells us something about how parents need to relate to children. When Adam and Eve first sinned, uh, God did not send a lightning bolt. God came and talked to them. Now, it was a conversation that was uncomfortable for Adam and Eve. They didn't like some of what they heard. Uh, there were consequences of their sin, but God came and talked to them. And at the end of the conversation, God made the striking promise that someday their descendant would crush the head of the serpent, a, a long-distance promise that Jesus would come as a savior. That's how God works with people. There's something there about how we should work with our children if you're a parent, or those under your authority if you're a school teacher, or a business owner, or a elder pastor in the church. And this is one of the biggest, most difficult tasks we have in life, is how do we represent God well in relationship to our children and the other people who are closest to us? How do we represent God well? Now, I would be remiss if I had mentioned the largest threat to both the emotional health and the worldview and faith of our children. And that is when parents are not loyal to each other and not loyal to their children and to their vows. To be an honorable parent, you're committing to raising that child with the other parent. That means you're committing to learn how to be a good husband and wife, 
That's part of the package. Children normally come to a husband and wife. And when a husband or wife separate or divorce, often, not always, but often, the real victims are the children. Sometimes children cope well, but many times they don't. And uh, you should keep that in mind, that if you are to be an honorable parent, that means learning how to be a good husband or wife. That's part of the deal we have. So if children are to honor their parents, parents have to learn how to become honorable. I suspect that many of the people who end up as statistics in a news book, newspaper or a sociology book are the people whose parents were not very honorable in relationship to them. They may have been let down by people who were in a position of authority over them. And we may have a lot to learn. Even if we're parents, we may have a lot to learn yet now. That's the first part. Second part is that children must learn how to honor their parents. I'll mention three principles for children. Some of these hard to explain because the children are in Sunday school right now. But uh, first one is that children, small children, must obey their parents. Uh, the, the commandment was worded partly for the children in their midst, I think. Fig assuming the parents would think about this, yeah, they would figure out just they have to be honorable parents. But it was worded primarily for the children. Children, honor your parents. And for young children, that means obedience. Paul interpreted it that way in Ephesians 6, in the words we read. He said, children, obey your parents. Uh, he's interpreting here. He doesn't directly quote the commandments. He referenced the commandment. But then he adds, in the Lord. Uh, I think he was thinking of the situation where some children in the church might have parents who tell them to do something that's contrary to God's word. And that in that situation, there is a limit to how much children should obey their parents. But normally, children must obey their parents unless the parents tell them to do something that's uh, clearly wrong according to God's word. So children, if you ever hear this, listen up. God expects you to obey most of the time, and predominantly. But this command also has application when you are older and are no longer small children. So teenagers, young adults, maybe midlife adults too, there are many things we have to do in relationship to our parents. You don't stop being a child even when you're 30 or 40 or 50, though you do things differently than when you're 3 or 4 or 5. Uh, you don't have to perhaps obey your parents in quite the same way, but it, there are other ways you must honor them. Uh, adult to adult companionship, thanking them, forgiving them. I don't know how many times I've heard people in their teens or 20s complain about their dysfunctional family, meaning their dysfunctional parents, and it really was, they were just angry at their parents. A little forgiveness was, was due. Uh, it may mean helping your parents in practical ways. Um, it surely means gratitude, honoring your parents. Well, I, uh, there's another way that was especially emphasized in the Jewish tradition. The Jewish tradition emphasized that adult children must take care of their elderly parents. Now we saw that in the reading from Matthew where Jesus mentions this, that the, some people said, well, if they give their money to the temple, then they don't need to use that money to take care of their elderly parents. Jesus was very unhappy with that. Uh, he thought that those who are able in midlife should take care of the elderly parents. That was part of what any good Jew or good Christian should know. And the Apostle Paul referenced that same principle uh, in 1 Timothy 3, I think it is. He says that uh, the widows in the church were not primarily to be taken care of by the church, they were primarily to be taken care of by the family. So there would be needy, dependent widows around, and Paul, as a good Jew, picked this up and included it in his explanation of what Christians should do, take care of your elderly parents. Now, um, a, a, good, a question that occurs to us as parents, or in my case, grandparents, is how to teach children to honor them. Uh, it doesn't work so very well just to tell your children, honor us, that may not be so convincing, the first point is, is what I've said before, being honorable. But also with that is consistent loving discipline, uh, particularly when children are smaller. But in addition to that, each of us teaches our children to be honoring by being honoring ourselves. 
most of us, perhaps all of us, are under some type of authority structure, even when we're no longer small children. I'm in my 60s, and I'm under several authority structures, places where I am accountable. Uh, I need to make sure that my children and grandchildren know part of some of that, that they realize that being accountable to someone, honoring someone, in some cases obeying someone, is a part of life. That's the way God created us. And it's not just something for small children. So uh, I'm still a, an ordained minister in the church in which I served as a young man. And I still, every year, give a report to the right committee of that church. Every now and then, when I can, I go visit them in person and give a personal report to the right committee of my church. That's a part of what the authority structure I live under. And it's only smart for me to tell my children or grandchildren about that so that they realize that when they honor their parents or others over them, that doesn't stop when you're 16. Even though I'm well into my 60s, I'm still doing that. I'm still accountable to people. And those people are accountable to me to give me some of what I need from them. Structure and order is part of the way God created us. And we have to let our children and grandchildren know that we accept that and that they have that, have that example in us. Now, I'd like to step, take a step back from this, from looking at honoring and being honorable, to look at the promise in this commandment. The promise is that intact relationships between generations make society and people to flourish. Uh, now, as I read the Bible, I normally try to carefully distinguish between the commands of God and the promises of God. I think that the wise application of the Bible always brings this to mind. What are the commands given here and what are the promises given here? But this is very unusual that we have a promise inside a command in the center of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the promise is that if we are honorable or honoring in the child, paired child, or child relationship, things tend to go better in whatever society we live in. Now recall the situation of the first hearers or the second hearers. First, they came out of Egypt and they got the Ten Commandments. About 40 years later, their children and grandchildren received the Ten Commandments a second time. And it was the second receiving that we had read this morning. But they were in the position of going into a new, new land to set up an entirely new society, starting from nothing almost, land and people and building from nothing. And here's one of the central principles they were given, is that if the parent-child relationship were intact, things should go well for them. They had to be diligent in caring for that relationship in order to have a promising future. This is not a future without problems. Of course there would be problems. It's not a future without illness and death. Of course that would come. But yet, in general, there was the promise that things would go well for them in the new land. There are, I think, a couple of paradoxes in this promise inside a commandment. The first is that the, the commands here are in, the, sing, are in sin, the singular form of the verb, whereas the promise is to the whole community in a plural sort of way. If you look at it in Hebrew, it distinguishes between different ways of saying you. Other languages do that today. Some of your languages may make the distinction between different ways you can say you. Hebrew did. And it distinguished between you singular and you plural. The yous here are singular. Each one of us has an obligation here, a duty to honor or be honorable. But the promise, in an ironic way, is not so much to the individual. The promise is to the entire community of believers. And that's how we have to look at that. Each of us has duties in the realm of the parent-child relationship, honoring and being honorable. That doesn't promise that things will go well for me individually so much, though generally it does help things go well. The promise is to us as the community, the community of believers, but also, also the civil community to some degree. Uh, sometimes you may read about the problems in society and you wish somebody would do something. Well, here it's you do something, you individually, you singular do something, be honoring and honorable uh, in, the, in the different places where we are, but especially in the parent-child relationship. 
Second thing that I find is ironic in this commandment is the, the nature of the commandment itself. Because in, in our modern society, and for most of us today, uh, we distinguish two different reasons for doing the right thing. Sometimes you do the right thing just because it's the right thing. Other times we're, we're told to do the right thing because there are good consequences that fall. Now in my work in regard to freedom of religion, at the highest level we constantly hear this distinction that yes, religious freedom is good just because it's right. Um, people should be respected in the freedom of conscience to form their own beliefs and convictions and to practice them. But then there's also a second line of discussion that comes in that we're, we tell people, and this is true, uh, freedom of religion has immense measurable consequences, good consequences in society. It reduces violence, it re, uh, increases, leads to higher levels of literacy, it re, it's one of the best indicators of future economic growth, it reduces religious extremism. We can go on and on talking about all the good benefits that come from religious freedom. Well, here, and, but always these two sides of argumentation are used. It's just good in itself, but there are also good consequences. We see both in this commandment. Honor parents just because it's the right thing to do. You're created through parents. You wouldn't exist if God had not created you through your parents. On the other hand, uh, honoring your parents and being honorable in that relationship has good consequences that flow from it. And I think we can describe those good consequences. Uh, so we can embrace this sort of irony or paradox in the commandment, the, the way it's stated. Now, I think we have a, probably all have a lot to learn in this commandment. Uh, I hope we all go away feeling a little bit uncomfortable, seeing things we should do differently, whether as parents or as children. Uh, last weekend, I was with, my, with three of my grandchildren in Washington, and I was talking with them and started telling them some stories from my childhood, started talking about my parents a little bit, and they were all ears. They're ages eight, six, and four, and they were so eager to hear that. And as I was talking with them, I realized that one of the ways I have to honor my parents, who are along with the Lord, is I need to tell my grandchildren about them. And my grandchildren were eager to hear something about their great-grandparents. Maybe something for you to do there. But we should not only apply this as individuals, we, as the people of the Bible, should see that we have here, in this commandment and the related principles, something that answers some of the deepest needs of our society. As a Christian community, we have something that answers one of the big problems of our world. And it's partly found in this commandment. Now, last weekend when I was with my son and his wife and their three children, whom I mentioned, they were invited to the first birthday party for a kid in their neighborhood. They asked me if I would like to go along. I declined because my injured hip was quite painful and I decided to stay home. But uh, later I wondered if I maybe should want to go because I learned the whole story of what was going on. This uh, first birthday party was for the child of a young woman who had recently started attending their church. She seemed very interested in getting to know the families in the church, and some of the families had responded and were spending some time with this mother. And they also had been invited to the birthday party. Now, this woman is 19 years old. She has two older children, ages three and four, though she's only 19. And my son, who went to the birthday party with his wife and their three children, reported that the, the baby daddy, as he's called now, was at the party and that he, like the unmarried mother of his ch child, uh, were interested in meeting intact families. And both the man and the woman had very little education, very little ability to get a good job. But, so there are lots of problems involved. But they were attracted to, as I understand it, attracted not only to the church for the worship service, but also attracted to the Christian families in the church and interested in seeing that there were, in fact, intact families where the mother and father were, were still together after many years and that they were honorably raising their children together. Now, I mentioned the story 
because in some ways that's what our world needs from us we started talking about the problem of delinquency kids who are having terrible problems some of the answer lies right here in this very old Ten Commandments uh, and that means we have to learn how to honor our children honor our parents or be honorable parents and honor our ch excuse me I'm getting confused honor our parents or be honorable parents but we also have to see in that in a very face-to-face -face kind of way one of the answers to the really big problems of our time let's pray together oh father what a challenge we face as i come before you i'm very aware that you told us to call you father meaning that you are a father to us and that fathers have a special obligation in this world. Help those of us who, who are parents to become honorable parents. Help those of us, all of us, who are children to honor our parents. Help us, Lord, to see how this meets some of the needs of the, the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.